So could we just begin by getting just your overall reaction to the budget that was presented yesterday? Having paid attention to cyclical factors, so massive help for those in the affected sector, attention turned very quickly to structural transformation. I think that there is a good historical precedent for thinking about how something like focusing on trend growth actually matters a lot over the long run. And that's uh, going back to the Great Depression uh, that began in 1929 for the U.S. and growth only resumed in 1933. And yet, if you look at the U.S. over a century, uh, despite a long slump, uh, it reverted back to a steady growth of 2% per annum. And that's because a lot of focus was ultimately on structural growth that uh, drove the U.S. economy over the longer term. Right. So you, you see this as a the, the, the switch from cyclical to structural as setting the foundations for steady growth in the future. That's correct. So in other words, you want to give immediate help, yeah. but there is a place for attention on what will happen uh, over the next several years because when this storm is passed, ultimately that is what is going to matter a lot for good jobs and good pay. Right. Thanks. Uh, Barnabas, what is your reaction to the budget overall? Well, as an economist, I look at um, the level of fiscal stimulus uh, compared uh, in FY 2021 versus FY 2020. And uh, basically, I look at um, the, the, the how much money is actually used to support the economy, right? If you just look at uh, FY 2020, um, almost 100 billion of war chest money is actually used you know, to support the economy. But in FY 2021, we have the 11 billion COVID package you know, to support the economy. You know, so there is a very huge difference between 100 billion versus 11 billion. What that means is that from a growth perspective, it could mean that the government is somewhat comfortable in tapering and allowing some policies and measures to lapse in order to support you know, growth and, and for the year ahead. And with that in mind, we would also have to understand you know, that Singapore is much geared towards growth compared to a minus 5.4% uh, uh, GDP rate in 2020. Right. You know, and now we are looking at well, of between four to six percent, you know. So with the lesser stimulus uh, monies that has been used in the pack, in in in, in budget, uh, it, it it does show that we are much well positioned right. to propel ourselves. There. Just are you comfortable with the four to six percent <coughs> growth projection for this year? Well, I think that there is still upside risk, actually. Upside uh, risk? Uh, oh, upside okay. risk. Uh, we are looking at 5% okay. uh, from UOB. You know, uh, but I think that, like, just look at uh, the Nordex figures uh, that was out uh, for January 2021. Right. It was at 12.8%, not wrong, on a year-on-year -year basis. 7% uh, on a month-on-month seasonally adjusted basis. It's big. It's huge. You know, and, and, and what we are looking at is that the semiconductors exports around the world has been picking up. Yeah. We are looking at probably you know, low base effect back in 2020. But then again, um, the vaccine is here. You know, uh, we, uh, COVID, the end of COVID-19, so to speak, it's at least in the crosshairs right, right now compared to what we see in 2020. It's a huge Okay. Environmental difference. All right, upside yeah. risk. I like that. Um, <laughs> Desmond, uh, from the vantage point of NTUC, mm. how do you view, view the budget overall? Well, I think there'll be a couple of things. I think the first one, to my overall feel is that it is mm. a very pro worker uh, budget mm. um, that quite nicely balanced support and transformation. Um, how does it come through? I think the support one, we are quite relieved that to see JSS continue to extend to the hard hit sectors. Um, aerospace, mm -hmm. aviation, hospitality, even extending uh, to some parts of retail. Mm. I think that's going to give uh, mm. companies and workers um, some relief at least all the way up to September. So I think that from our perspective, I think that's quite solid. Um, the other one that we thought was really good was the JGI. Mm. I think important as we come mm. out from the uh, lowest of the crises, mm. you want to show up hiring, meaning mm. you want companies to hire ahead of time, right. ahead of demand, have some confidence in their cash flow, JGI is going to help uh, quite a fair bit. The JGI being the jobs growth incentive, yeah. which basically mm. subsidizes hiring. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, okay. sure. I think key on companies' minds is 
how much in advance of uh, increase in demand do I want to hire? Right. I think that's going to help. I think the, the results uh, from the first tranche, 110,000, I think that's very promising. Right. Are we certainly looking forward to the second one? Right. So as we come up from an economic uh, crisis, there will be a rebound. Mm. So from the labour perspective, we're always looking into how can workers leverage on that rebound. And that is where things get a bit more exciting. We know that companies need to get better. They need to be on a tech bandwagon. They need to digitize so that our workers uh, can get better jobs. So we, we see a lot of support given to companies from that perspective. Right. So that is going to prime um, Singapore for that growth and Singaporean workers uh, to get better jobs and better pay uh, when the rebound comes. Right. So uh, as, as a unionist, uh, we have to be happy uh, with this package. Uh, I think really from the near term to the longer term, 24 billion worth three years, we will have to be quite excited uh, at opportunities. Right. Okay, we'll drill down into some of the issues you mentioned a little later. Yeah. But first, let me get uh, uh, Douglas's view from the, the point of view of the business community. Uh, how would you react to the budget? How does the business community take the budget, according to you? Mm, I would humbly think, look at the budget, because right now we're still in the midst of a pandemic. Right. Um, it is actually remarkably balanced. It is able to target on the short-term challenges that enterprises are facing. So it's very focused on all those groups that are, some of those groups that are heavily impacted, like aerospace, aviation, tourism. And at the same time, it's scaled back on the certain sectors that are already on the rebound. But yet at the same time, there are also initiatives helping those on the rebound to do even better. Mm -hmm and to innovate and transform for the challenges and the opportunities going forward. Right. Then, on the other front, it's actually very forward-looking and progressive, both for the enterprises and the individual. And then, at the same time, it has got a, a whole area on the social compact and also on sustainability for the environment as well. Right. So, within a pandemic, to be able to craft out a, a budget of such coverage, it is remarkable. Yes. Yep. Yes, the budget certainly covers a lot of ground. Yep. Yeah. And we, won't be, we won't have time to go into everything, mm. but we'll, we'll, we will focus on some issues. Uh, Desmond, you, you mentioned uh, <coughs> relief mm. at the, the JSS, the job, mm. secu uh, jo uh, job support scheme being extended for the hard hit mm. sectors the so-called tier one sectors, mm. which is uh, aviation, aerospace, and tourism. Mm. Okay, but the extension is at 30% mm. of wages till June, and thereafter, from July to September, only 10%. Mm. Now, I think a lot of companies in these areas are no better off than when the pandemic started mm. in January. I mean, it's pretty much the same situation, Changi Airport, Visitor arrivals have not changed since, since what, February. Mm. So my question here is, will the, this level of JSS support be enough for these, these companies? Mm. Uh, of course, we have to bear in mind also that there's a $870 million, uh, package for aviation, mm. and there's also a, what, $45 million package for the arts mm. and the sports sectors. So there is other help other than Mm. the the JSS but I think I think it's a fair question to ask whether this JSS support is too little mm. um, we have been working with these uh, three sectors for quite a while um, I think over the course of 2020 um, you have seen some restructuring um, in fact uh, some workers will need to be redeployed um, some have been retrenched and we found them new jobs mm. so I think they're working off uh, a much uh, better cost structure now but on the matter of how long it would take, I think there's a bit gazing into uh, the crystal ball. Um, I think for now, um, it should keep cash flow uh, flowing a bit better. Uh, we also have training grants to the SG United, um, skills and training. They will provide training support because quite critical during this period of time is not only just to keep the companies afloat, but you really want the workforce to be upgraded. Nothing beats a recession or downtime to retool, reskill workers. So that when the rebound comes, our workers are in a better state to get those better jobs in that sector. Right. So, so we not only just look at the JSS, but we want to look at JSS and the training 
yes. um, and aviation support. Right. So from that perspective, um, I think we are comforted. But of course, as the government has shown uh, in 2020, it's gone to five budgets. So um, I think if needed, um, I think the labour movement will continue to make those calls, work with the workers, and if it's still continuing to not see a uh, rebound, mm -hmm. uh, really depending on how the global economy uh, comes about, then I think we can make a, another push uh, for that kind of support. Right. So over the next few months, we're quite critical for us. Uh, we're working quite closely with the companies and the workers, making sure that they get those training, making sure that they tap on those grants, and if things rebound, all well and good, but if things are not, we'll be working closely with the agencies. Right. Any other thoughts uh, yeah, on, maybe, the, maybe, on this topic? Yes, so just to add to what Desmond was saying, mm. uh, uh, at some level, obviously, uh, the JSS, particularly for the affected sector, uh, primarily keeps the worker employed, uh, even <coughs> though there is no uh, uh, productive market to sell your product to. Uh, so, so in effect, it is uh, 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 an effort to achieve the government's stabilization objective. That's the cyclical part of it. If there wasn't the JSS, uh, all jobs here would be lost. So, so it kind of it gets back to this uh, challenge that with finite fiscal resources, and what's different about this shock say, compared to 1984-85 when Singapore had its really sharpest recession uh, since the independence, and then you go back to say 97 Asian financial crisis shock. Those were, sh those were shocks that were short-lived. And so you could put a lot of stimulus power to get the economy back, and more or less you are back to potential output. And, and, and then you are focused on the growth. So what, what is peculiar uh, uh, about this particular shock is both that in all likelihood it's going to go beyond a year. We're talking about most likely at least one more year and potentially even longer. So there's uncertainty about how long this slump will go, together with other uh, uncertainties that, that also cloud the, uh, the, the, the typical uh, way we, we, we would have helped the economy. So I guess at some level then, one has to make a judgment call about how long you keep the business, how long you keep the worker in a sector that would uh, uh, in normal time, be just having a, a, a recession and then rebound. Uh, uh, you know, so at, at which point do you actually allow the creative destruction process to work so that uh, firms automatically move to areas where their potential uh, to grow? Maybe they will reinvent themselves within the same, same sector, but you want to allow some of them to say, then maybe I move out of tourism sector and again to some other sector, which is why then this kind of complementarity, I think, between the objective to still save jobs in the sectors that we clearly identify will, will, will still be in a slum, uh, that you provide all the other things that go back at least to 2016 where we, where we began our industry transformation map, uh, I think DPM Heng referred to that uh, in talking about the measures that will uh, generate Singapore's growth in this next phase as the mature economy. It's about innovation. And for innovation, you've got to reach the, the international market. It is about financing startups. And it is perhaps also giving support to our successful local uh, enterprises, large local enterprises, the LLEs. Uh, uh, you know, the idea of equity financing with the Masi, let them reach a, a wider market. So the idea is that if you are thinking of a slum is down, and at some stage, maybe only uh, two, three years later, finally you're back to a higher trend growth. Mm. And so there will be this sort of calculation. Uh, government with, with finite fiscal resources would have to trade off between more help, uh, not just for the affected sector, because even the other sectors that on the whole have begun to do well, manufacturing that Barnabas talk about, there are some firms that, that, that will still retrench, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and so you've got to balance the, the use of your resources between that and then get a very good trend growth when the economy rebounds. So right. it's a big judgment call. Right. Let me add to Professor sure. Cohen on mm -hmm. uh, his comments. I think for, especially for the job support scheme, mm -hmm. we have to understand two key issues at hand. The job support scheme 
has been very effective, at least in the year 2020. Yes. A lot of jobs have been saved, you know, but one thing that everybody will know by looking at the appendix in FY 2021's budget is that the JSS is inherently expensive. Yes. Look at the special transfers. 25 know. billion, totally, right? Yeah, and yes. it's actually 50%, or just, just above 50% of the total special transfers. You know, it's, it's inherently expensive. Yes. You know, that's one. So I think, uh, as what Prof. Fulman also said, there's a balance that's, that we, we, we would have to understand that we are here for the long haul. We have to, you know, for lack of a better word, budget yes. the amount of resources that we have so that Singapore is well positioned to carry through. That's the first point. But I think the second point really is that the tenets of economics uh, have actually taught us that over-reliance on, on government support for the long run it will actually cause or inject some sort of, uh, of, of, of to, to, to make companies less competitive mm. in the long run, you know. And when there is over-reliance and when, there's so, so hence there is a need to slowly taper right. the job support scheme to allow the, 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 the economy in general to be on the landing board so that we can bounce off once COVID-19 ends. Right. That's one, you know. Uh, but I think one thing about whether it's enough or not, uh, we must also understand that the JSS has been tweaked in the year 2020. Yes. You know, and if it's indeed not enough, I do believe that it's not cast in stone, the 30% and the 10% support measures. I think the government will most likely look into it as well and, yeah, make do. Play by you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And from the business <laughs> perspective, the businesses and enterprises. Um, from both uh, all the Singapore Business Federations are very appreciative and grateful for the GSS in the budget, in the four budget in uh, 2020. And they are not in an illusion that this is going to be a, a forever thing because it comes with a cost. It either comes through a cost of higher corporate tax or whatever ways that you need to recover, right? And that's why when the budget 2021 was released yes, last, yesterday, mm -hmm. it was very clear that it was targeted to assist those that are heavily impacted mm -hmm. so that they can then go face those challenges. And I think through the rest of the distinguished panelists have spoken that it is not cast in stone, that there could be re review going forward as well. Yeah. And now the impetus is on the enterprises and the workforce to then transform going forward. Yes. Because this is the exact tripartite relation that is a signature of the economic success as a, the, the, the kind of foundation that's been built upon for Singapore. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, for the tier three companies, so-called, which are the least affected by the, the, the JSS is going to expire next month. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I think there's a question that arises. Um, these companies have also benefited from bank forbearance, right? The banks have, have been basically lenient with some of their loan, loan obligations. They've also had reliefs from contractual obligations, right? Now, those things are also going to come to an end sometime this year. I mean, it depends on banks. For some customers, they might extend it longer. But basically, it's going to happen this year. So they're going to be without any further support. So one thing that's been interesting is that last year the bankruptcies were repressed, were in fact lower than in 2019. Mm. Yeah. So when all these supports are removed, is there a danger that bankruptcies will go up and you will have layoffs? Uh, Desmond, what do you think of that? I think there's something that uh, is very real and uh, we should always be on the lookout for uh, any point in time, uh, in any year, you will have bankruptcies and you will have uh, workers who are laid off either for structural reasons or for cyclical ones. I think for here, you're going to have a combination of two, whereby it's going to be part cyclical because the COVID is still hitting you. Uh, you're going to have uh, structural changes have been brought forward, uh, leaps and bounds. For example, the impact of e-commerce on retail right. uh, is very real. So you're going to have these two prongs in place and you cannot avoid those two trends. So while you cannot protect all the jobs, I think the critical thing for us to do is do we have a good enough placement system mm. that allows you to retrain and redeploy workers to parts of the economy where they can be better served. 
Mm -hmm. So I think that is the capability that uh, we must invest resources to build. Because it's not only just for this crisis, and this will not be the last economic crisis we will face. Uh, the structural changes are coming fast and furious. Now we're not only talking about working from home, we're talking about working from anywhere. Mm. And that by itself transforms the way workforce operates, mm. meaning that workers will be in and out of jobs a lot more frequently than we expect. So the placement system, uh, which you have uh, through WSGE2I, right, tapping on programs as United Skills and uh, training, is going to allow us to build that capability. And we've been doing that over the course of the last few years. Um, so you will see that why some of the layoffs have been lower mm. is because that we are able to get workers mm. uh, either to stay in their job, retrain, redesign those jobs, mm. and if we couldn't, redeploy them. Right. So you almost need that to have the trampoline effect uh, for Singapore to cope. So in 2021, we'll be watching this quite closely. Um, in NTUC, we set up this thing called the Job Security Council. Job Security Council, okay. which effectively work in advance with companies saying that if you have people that you are going to lay off and you know that, you let us know first so that we can reduce, uh, really mitigate against larger scale layoffs, giving workers the chance to go to another company, uh, taking the chance to retrain. So I think those kind of systems, uh, while not going to be foolproof, you're still going to have layoffs, it's going to reduce that attrition and it's going to allow our workers uh, to rebound a lot faster. Well, let me add on to what Desmond was saying, which kind of focus on uh, one strength that we have with the prospect that there would be increased bankruptcies, particularly uh, in the affected sector, uh, but also in the non-affected uh, sector, which is uh, whether there are identifiable areas of the economy where you think there would be new growth sources. Mm. Of course, finally, the businessman who smells out where the opportunity dives in, takes the risk and then succeed. But I think that, uh, again, if you go back to the point that uh, uh, the, the future economy had already begun a restructuring process for Singapore uh, back five years five ago, years ago. Uh, that we are building upon uh, some reasonably clear sectors where, I, where we think we have comparative advantage. Uh, now the clouds are a bit more misty because of the cyclical shock. But I think in broad terms, I get a sense, especially with the RIE 2025, the new research uh, focus where the government would put its $25 billion over the five years. There are some identifiable sectors. Uh, I mean, Singapore has always shown that in a crisis, there are certain opportunities that you can turn to uh, to bring benefits to its own people in good jobs, good pay, and so on. So uh, uh, with the pandemic, uh, health human potential, I think is one area identified in RIE 2025. Uh, today, compared to, say, 1984, uh, we have the higher inst institutes of higher learning uh, that have uh, uh, professors uh, who engage in research. There could be good synergy between uh, professors with ideas, uh, uh, working with companies to commercialize uh, products that can come out within the health area. Uh, we have advanced manufacturing. Yep. Uh, uh, I mean, in the old days, one would say that as the country became richer, uh, as capital accumulated, manufacturing was string. But I think that a broader lesson we seem to learn, just looking at countries across the board, is that deindustrialization, the, the, how manufacturing begins to string, uh, happens at a much earlier stage. And so I think that uh, uh, advanced manufacturing in particular draws upon a set of talent pool uh, that's not going to make manufacturing like the 1960s. It's not going to be labor intensive, textile garments and so on. There is a place uh, 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 in advanced manufacturing where there is potential for growth. So that's another area in RIE 2025. Okay. Then you've got urban design. That's just another yeah. possibility because the budget was also focused on sustainability and so on. So there are opportunities in there. And then the digitalization of a service economy in mm. which, again, we have comparative advantage. Okay. So I think that if we keep our eyes on this broad 
directions. Yeah. Uh, uh, the hope is that this become the areas in which you have firm, uh, you, in which you have new firm creation. Yeah. Because that's always been the process of growth. There are some firms that are destroyed, but there are new opportunities. This is that the they move creative destruct destruction that you were talking creative about. Creative destruction. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, can we just switch gears a little bit? Um, so, Desmond, you talked about the yeah. SG United <coughs> Jobs and Skills Package, which has been a great success. It's created uh, some 100, 100 over 1,000 opportunities, um, many of which are full time jobs. Um, and now it's been taken to another level. Uh, the aim is to create 200,000 mm. opportunities uh, with the new version. But despite the success, uh, th there was in re December still reported to be 130,000 vacancies mm. that have yet to be filled. Mm. So why are there so many vacancies? Why are these, why are these remaining unfilled? And is there a danger that you will again you'll get the opportunities created, but they'll be vacant. Yeah. I mean, I mean there, are things, there are two reasons for this. I think one is asymmetric, uh, asymmetric information, meaning that uh, information just doesn't flow perfectly. There could be a job that better suits you, pays you better, but because you're so much more comfortable in your current job, mm. you don't switch. I think the other one that you're going to have is, is a skills gap, because a lot of the jobs that we're creating now uh, in spaces whereby it's a bit more tech driven, a bit more digital, and our workers might not necessarily have those skills. So you're going to have mismatches and missed matches. That, I think that is where that, the marketplace of jobs needs to flow a lot better. But I think the good thing for us is when we keep vacancies high, I think that allows workers uh, to have the incentive to train and get a job much quicker. I think that is in contrast to many other economies whereby you have more workers than jobs. Mm. So you're essentially training for jobs that you might not be able to land something on to. So on one hand, we're quite happy that uh, the vacancy is going to create more opportunities for our workers. But on the other hand, we know we just have to work a lot harder uh, to get our workers trained up and to be able to get our workers to know that the opportunities are more than what you see now. Right. So I think that's our, our challenge. Uh, we also want to look into a couple of areas. One is older workers, mm. how they can be retrained to some of these jobs. I think those are opportunities. And of course, um, areas whereby our people might have dropped off the workforce for all sorts of reasons, family care reasons, to be able to work from home to tap on these opportunities. Right. So it requires to redesign jobs, requires to retrain our workers, and for us to create the marketplace of placement uh, into a more robust structure. Right. Yeah, Douglas, I wanted to come to you on this because, uh, I mean, it's companies in your business federations that have created these opportunities and yet are not able to fill the vacancy. So uh, why is that from a business point of view? Um, the, the fact is uh, we, we have always been in a very tight labour market to, to begin with. Yeah. Uh, and over the last few years, um, all this mismatch, mismatch, uh, are now being uh, managed by Workforce Singapore WSG and E2I. There's actually a My Career Future portal yes. that actually is using a lot of uh, digitalization, data an analytics, and artificial intelligence to help. So we are actually in a much better position as compared to some time back. Right. Some time back, we even have a lot of uh, issues on that. And that actually answers your previous question about with the tapering of where the tier three, uh, will you result in a lot of people not getting jobs? Then the next question that is being posed is, there are actually a lot of job vacancies. Yes. So it's about how the balance of the expectations of the job seekers, um, being able to then upskill, reskill, or cross-skill even to some of those skill sets required in the future businesses. Because the enterprises are transforming. Five years ago, we started with the industry uh, transformation map. But the industry transformation map has also had to transform itself yes. because of the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. So through that, the enterprises are also transforming, the workforce is transforming, and the nation is actually transforming. So all parts are now moving together. And that's why earlier on, I, I actually briefly touched on the tripartism, mm -hmm. because that actually gives that sense of trust between the various stakeholders for this very difficult exercise 
to carry forward in this long journey mm -hmm. because none of us know actually when it's going to end uh, it, it, it will, it, the pandemic will end eventually and life will still go on but because of the trust that we have built over the many many years i think we are now in a very good state and we are now in really in the in a position to actually what the budget talk about to emerge stronger right mm -hmm. yeah, okay. uh, Vikram, just a quick footnote just uh, with Douglas pointing out tripartism, mm. Mm. I, I can't. I just can't help uh, pointing out that that really, at some level, is a huge strength for the country. Yeah. And tripartism has allowed us to overcome these negative shocks in clearly different ways. If you go back to 1984, well, many of my panelists were very young then, but I remember 84. I was finishing my honours year, and uh, here, 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 the country was hit. And uh, how do we deal with it? Well, a big part of the measure was a 15 percentage point cut in uh, CPA. employer CPA contribution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, were, there were no job uh, credit mm. at that time. Yeah. It wasn't the government absorbing the wage cost. The workers accepted the, mm -hmm. the wage cut. Mm. I had the opportunity actually to give a talk in another foreign country and I was speaking to mm. unionists, I was speaking to employers, I was speaking to the government and I told them about this episode mm. and their jaw dropped. In <laughs> which country <laughs> would you have a, a union that would accept a wage cut but the economy recovered mm. and then gradually the CPF rate was restored, not to the original level mm -hmm. because you're 25 percentage point, you kind of set a more optimal level, I think like 2020. Mm -hmm. yep. I hear Douglas uh, kind of with a deep understanding of employer talking about tripartism. And I hear that tripartism here is about now creating a productivity growth with the necessary creative destruction yeah. that we talk about. Yeah. And, and that might be our new competitive advantage uh, moving forward. Right, yeah. right. So, um, okay, Barnabas, I, I want to come to the issue of uh, government partnering with Temasek to take equity stakes in large local enterprises. Um, first of all, your, your comments mm. on that in general. Mm. And, but my question really mm. is why aren't these large local enterprises able to raise private equity on their own? Why do they need this kind of support to raise equity? Mm, I think a very quick answer from that really is that, um, well, the, I think the saying goes, never waste a good crisis. You know, mm. And uh, with that in mind, um, what we can assume really is the fact that uh, private firms uh, that are really surviving right now in, uh, in the year 2020 and the year 2021 uh, are those that have already shown signs of strength and resilience, especially in the face of the crisis. But then again, with the crisis, there would be, uh, the, mo the more realistic expectation really is that profits as well as uh, the overheads uh, has been somewhat severely impacted. You know? So the, 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 the raising of private equity and, and, and more so Tomasic having, uh, uh, helping these companies through, 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 through uh, the question that you just mentioned, uh, it's somewhat necessary in order to keep, it's, it could be one of the efforts by the government to keep uh, the companies competitive you know, and as well more so afloat so that we are able you know, to take opportunities when COVID-19 ends. Right. Yeah. Uh, Vikram, just, uh, I'm just adding mm. on. Uh, professor, speak <coughs> little points, they hear something. Yeah. Just Briefly. two quick points to add to Barnabas because it's really striking to me. This yeah. is the first time I think I've heard explicitly in the budget talking about large local enterprises and yeah. where the Masse holdings here comes in and, 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 and mm. your, thing of, <coughs> your question was about what advantages there are really quite apart from uh, the market coming in to facilitate, uh, to play a part in the equity financing. I think that, that there might be two things that are kind of important for our large local enterprises. So, I mean, they are larger. They are obviously have been more mm. successful, right, compared to the smaller uh, enterprise within the same industry. Because within any industry, there are larger firms, smaller firms. Mm. But there are two things that I think from economic research we know uh, that can further kind of strengthen the productivity of our large local enterprises. The first is large local enterprises being able to break into overseas markets. There are two reasons why selling overseas, if they have not been so successful yet, and largely serving a domestic market, that going overseas can help us raise the productivity that can ultimately lead to better jobs and better pay. The first of all, uh, uh, it's a self-selection effect. Uh, only the larger local enterprises that feel they have a chance to 
to, with some help from the market holding break into an overseas market would want to say I want to to, to join the scheme mm -hmm. and and so and so that self selection kind of gives uh, a signal for the for the more uh, adventurous uh, uh, firms to, to come in more productive and then uh, they, they get the help to sell overseas but secondly we also know that there is learning from exporting if you have to try to break into a regional market there's a lot more you got to learn uh, obviously when you sell an overseas market is a larger market your average cost goes down your productivity goes up so for both kinds of reasons I think that uh, the 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 Tamasic holding which has a lot of experience mm. with overseas markets uh, i think can bring to the lles mm. second point i think that uh, you know in our context because our growth in the very early stage which which was what brought us success was a large role played by multinational corporations whom i must say continue to play a very important role because they are large they give good job they give good pay and, 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 it, and if you have a person graduating from SMU, for example, where I'm from, uh, or, or NUS, well, uh, you know, it's not uncommon that their first job is an MNC, right? Uh, do I want to go <laughs> to an LLE? Well, a little bit uncertain, right? And, and so I think this partnering with the Masse Holding, I think, can produce a little bit of a signaling effect for our students who say maybe actually it might be more exciting to join LLE because there's larger potential for me to express my creative ideas about how to break in the overseas markets and so on for example so it might help to be a draw this is not a prediction okay. but, but this is a potential draw for for good workers yep. because i'm sure the lles have to struggle with finding really really good employees i don't think dbs bank has to struggle at all for example <laughs> i don't know <laughs> oh, anyway yeah. no maybe, yeah. maybe sia has to struggle right now but uh, yeah yeah but okay um any, any other thoughts on the Temasek? Uh... Well, I think what Professor is, uh, I mean, if, 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 if I could just add on to what uh, Prof Hoon has mentioned, uh, importantly, Singapore cannot be inward looking. Yes. You know, all the talk about innovating, about collaborating globally and stuff like that. Look at us. We are a very special economy. Mm. We, have, we don't have something that a lot of other countries have, and that's natural resources. But there's one thing that we do have, which is talent. You know, uh, and 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 really the the, the drive to innovate and 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 and, and the drive to, to develop deep capabilities within uh, our various industries and mm. and whatnot. But the important thing is that if you look at the past budgets, even in the even in the unity budget when mm. we first came out uh, at the very first budget of 2020, there is still the need to look ahead. There mm. is still a need to look away from Singapore abroad so that companies could deepen capabilities as well as have presence overseas. The crisis has taught, taught us a one key lesson is that companies who has online presence, who deals with e-commerce, for example, are the ones that are poised to succeed. Right. Okay. Yeah. Desmond, I want to bring you in <laughs> on this since yeah. uh, we've also talked about uh, working from home, we mm -hmm. talked about e-commerce. Mm -hmm. One of the things, the trends uh, that is happening is the rise of the self-employed. Mm. Um, self-employed are a larger and larger proportion of the workforce. And I think there are questions around how <coughs> do we ensure job security and retirement adequacy uh, for this group of workers. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, DPM Heng actually alluded to this mm. in the budget, but he did. He said that there's discussions going on. Mm. So can you enlighten us? What 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 can be done mm. for retirement and for job security for self-employed workers? I think we have to trace back to what this COVID situation has brought up. Some mm. of the structural issues right. with the self-employed group. I think what this COVID has shown is that the from the social security point of view, the self-employed persons are really quite poorly provided for because they take all the discretionary income, they don't have CPF contribution or quite minimal depending on which sector you're in, you have some Medisafe. When it comes to a crisis, you're actually quite underprovided for. The second thing is you see that actually provides quite good job opportunities when you need to be in between jobs. You can fill in some of these things on a part-time basis, but in terms of your bargaining powers with the platforms, you're at a distinct 
disadvantage. Right. So with these two structural issues, I think the next step for us to take, which we've been starting already, is that firstly, we need to look into the retirement adequacy. So that, for example, uh, do we need to look into uh, a scheme, for example, like what we've done for our taxi drivers? They contribute to their Medisafe, right? Uh, for their licenses, so that we know that they're provided for. The so who contributes? The, the, the company is hiring them. The cap uh, they themselves also need to contribute yeah. uh, part of their uh, income towards the Medisafe. Okay. Now, but the issue, of course, is that then your take-home income will be less. Right. So it's something that we need to really study longer term because a lot of the workers who go into this trade really do need those cash on hand. Mm. So we need to study this. Mm -hmm. And how can government play a role? For example, a matching scheme. Uh, I think some things are possible. The other thing that we need to look at is the platform workers, meaning that workers who work for large platforms. Mm -hmm. Because they are they're self-employed, they're not unionized, there's no collective strength given. So your bargaining powers is very lopsided. I can change terms, I can change incentive structure, mm -hmm. right. as and when I want in the left and the lurch. We think that if we can provide a more level playing field, the self-employed people are not only going to be better provided, I think it will allow it to thrive as an essential part of the workforce. So our perspective of this needs to evolve from them just doing part-timing jobs, filling in between jobs, to that this is the essential permanent part of the workforce. And you need to treat it in that way so that you provide those structural support. Mm. So we'll be quite interested to look into um, how can we set up associations for them, right? Uh, whether legislatively uh, we need to make some changes so that, that they can be better put, uh, protected vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, platforms. I think uh, there are quite a lot of overseas examples that we can look at, um, but I think going ahead from uh, even from last year uh, to the next couple of years, I think that is going to be one big piece of work um, that the country needs to focus on. But can they join NTUC? Um, Yes, even now they already uh, some of them are part of NTUC. Mm. Okay. So you have you have the Grab drivers, the private hire guys. Right. Um, they join us in our private hire vehicles association. Okay. Mm. Um, so they are given some driver relief. We provide some hardship relief. Right. But we cannot represent them collectively. Mm. I, I mean, we would love to be able to talk to some of these platform companies and say that hey, before you change any terms, you have to talk to you have to get the support from the workers first. Mm. And I think with that not only they can they protect them, then they see as a career they can grow. Mm. Now is hit and run. I yeah. go in and make my money, I come out. But what about the investment in their training? Mm. What about the investment in their retirement adequacy? Uh, those are things that are not there. I think the Singapore workforce being as small as it is will be poorer for it if we don't start looking at it as a form of permanent fixture in the workforce mm. rather than a very transient uh, entity as it is now. Right. Mm. Very good. Um, we, we, are, we have less and less time, so I'd like to come to uh, one of the, the new mm. things in the budget, which is the, um, the government's plan to fund major infrastructure through borrowing. Uh, Singapore has not been very uh, happy to, to be a borrower uh, traditionally, but I think they've now kind of like lifted, lifted the lid a little bit. No, no, they, mm -hmm. Singapore has borrowed, but not without, without any net debt. They borrow to invest. They don't mm -hmm. borrow to spend. Mm -hmm. But now they are willing to borrow to spend, but only on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering what the thoughts are on this. Yeah. My, I, I just raised one issue that I think is worth considering, and that there's also some non-infrastructure areas that yield good returns you know, over say 15 years. I mean, you can think of reskilling, mm. you can think of R&D, you can think of digitization. These things yield positive returns. So why not, I mean, th and these are covered by recurrent spending. <laughs> so why not include these also in, in borrowing? Uh, I don't know, what what do you think, yeah. first of may, all, may of the I plan to borrow, yeah. may, and may I just second, uh, jump in to broaden that. it yeah. beyond infrastructure? Yeah. May I jump into that, because uh, uh, this is, from uh, the uh, fiscal point of view, quite a new thing. Uh, uh, but particularly, Vikram, as you bring in uh, the whole point that uh, uh, since we have already begun to talk about uh, financing uh, long-term infrastructure projects, 
like uh, the MRT line, like the infrastructure you need to uh, avoid rising sea level, which are uh, multi-year uh, infrastructural issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that had been mentioned before. A study was made, and now the government is saying we're going to consider a bill to deal right. with that. But you also threw in uh, uh, what would have been an obvious point. Look, interest rates are so low. Why, why not something mm -hmm. else, right, that's, that's recurrent? So, so, so let me... Uh, uh, Answer that uh, kind of from more a macro perspective about uh, the, the fiscal prudence that as a whole has been a characteristic of the government since independence. And uh, uh, the fact that uh, we are at triple A rating uh, it, it didn't come by accident. It came by essentially a very fiscal uh, a fiscally prudent approach that uh, says that I keep my tax rate uh, reasonably steady and then I generate the growth that's needed. So the tax base has expanded, we have generated uh, revenues and so over time which is why we are where we are with the uh, reserve that we have and then being able to draw in our uh, uh, NIRC uh, mm -hmm. which is the largest component. Yeah. I was just doing a the calculation net this morning. Net Meaning investment returns. Net yeah. investment uh, uh, returns uh, from the, 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 the expected returns from our reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's the largest component, close to like 25%, I yeah. think, even mm -hmm. higher than mm -hmm. the tax revenue that we are expected to generate of corporate taxes yeah. and personal income yeah. uh, uh, taxes. So I think that uh, what it is, is that that fiscal prudence uh, has generated an overall mindset that say we better work hard to generate the required potential growth, which is back to the whole point about paying attention to the trend growth, mm -hmm. because ultimately that's what's going to, mat to, to matter. And generating something like 2% growth per annum on average of productivity growth. It's a very important target. The U.S. managed that over the 20th century. At that rate, we'll, gen we'll, we'll double our income every 35 years. Uh, so, so you want to you you want to to keep that. Uh, uh, so, I I think that we can reasonably, on fiscal principles, say, on matters that have got to do with a project that can well take over a decade. Future generations can share the cost with current generation. I think on any fiscal principle, mm -hmm. you can make a case. And so I think we can write on the fact that precisely because we have been fiscally prudent, mm -hmm. we could take advantage and borrow for infrastructural projects that can be well justified on fiscal principle. Yeah. But I think I, I, I would hasten to say, just be a little bit careful about saying that I now kind of like make a major pivot because it would be a very different turn to begin to say that I want to begin to also borrow since interest rates are very low. Uh, because th there's an interesting IMF study, I think a 2020 study actually, that looks at 55 countries over 200 years, of both advanced economies and emerging economies. Historically, you have many episodes where interest rates have been lower than growth rates. Mm -hmm. But that has not made it less likely uh, that countries have had uh, a flight of capital. There have been sovereign defaults, uh, even in eras of very low interest rates. Mm -hmm. and, and the finding over there is that interest rate might be very low, but several months before you, you, you look, at, look at the example from that study, uh, uh, before, before there is actually a sovereign default, the, the marginal cost of borrowing, that, that means the cost of additional borrowing can sharply go up. Mm. You know? so, so it is not the case that even in a low interest rate environment, uh, sure, I mean, we have built our reputation <coughs> uh, 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 to be able to, to, to have the good credit rating, but I would, I would be very hesitant about, about this major pivot uh, to argue for borrowing for recurrent spending. Okay. Yeah. This is a very, very big question that you <coughs> asked, Vikram. You know, and uh, I think a deeper question that we can also ask ourselves is why didn't the government um, issue bonds to finance the Medeca package or the Pioneer 
generation package that was out many years ago. Mm -hmm. I think the government did position itself in the budget as uh, at, at these packages are actually out there to to to, to celebrate this uh, this generation. You know the mm. the the nation building generation. You know and hence you know that is this providence this provision mm. for this generation. Now, the issuance of bonds, so to speak, to finance infrastructure, it's, uh, I would say it's a very elegant. It makes sense. Totally. It makes sense. It's, totally. it's a very elegant solution because right. it allows the future generation right. to partake yep. in paying. Because, you know, uh, why didn't we issue bonds to build Changi Airport, you know, the Changi Airport Development yeah. Fund many years ago, and I believe it's about 8 billion or, 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 or so, you know. Um, because it's much for the economic transformation during the pandemic, you know, we, we, it's, 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 to, it's to build up Changi Airport, you know, for foreign business, so to speak, has nothing to do, you know, for, uh, 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 for the future generations. But infrastructure is something that the future generations will actually enjoy. Mm -hmm. And hence, the bonds is actually there, you know, to help. Important point, really, uh, is that Singapore is very much a country mm -hmm. compared to other countries which, whereby we have zero foreign debt. Zero foreign debt, you know, compared to other uh, economies when we face COVID-19 yep. back in, you know, the World Bank didn't come in to help us. You know, we had deep pockets, you know, to sustain and to, you know, and as what Prof. Hun say, the right. triple A did come by accident. Right. Douglas, since you have been involved in the food industry, mm. or you're still involved in the food industry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not so. Just a little bit. <laughs> okay. Sake There's sushi. a $60 million allocation to the agri-industry in this budget to boost food production, right? And this includes especially seafood, which is your specialty. Mm. Um, and the goal is to produce 30% of Singapore's nutritional needs by 2030, the so-called 3030 mm. plan, right? At the moment, it's only 10%. We produce only about 10% of our nutritional needs. Mm. Mm. We want to raise it to 30% in less than 10 years. Mm. That sounds pretty ambitious. Now, is it achievable? It is very ambitious to begin with. It's a very stretched target. Uh, and without technology, with our limited uh, size in terms of land and space and people, it is going to be very tough. But today, the world has evolved. The world has evolved to become digital. The world has evolved into what Early on, Prof mentioned about advanced manufacturing and many of these things. Mm -hmm. The industrialization, industrial 4.0 journey, have actually changed many things. Aquaculture, aqua farming, agriculture, agri farming are no longer farming. It cuts into manufacturing. Oh, it cuts all the way even into now. You can even create food in the lab. Yeah. Mm. Right. So that is actually your nutrition needs in the lab. So that one is really uh, taken. So that's manufacturing rather than farming, right? It's manufacturing because you're actually creating cell. It's cellular. It's pharmaceutical. Yeah. It's, it's more than just your usual medication. It's your nutritional needs on a daily basis. And because you're able to control the light, you're able to control the temperature, you're able to control your understanding. Because when the fish is swimming, it actually grows in size. And if you're able to actually create an illusion that instead of a 20, you know, the usual uh, time is 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of nighttime, right? So you imagine you could create 22 or 23 hours of daylight. The fish doesn't know that it has only one hour to rest. <laughs> you will continue to be swimming for 23 hours and grow much faster. Yeah. And you give it feed at a certain timing, it continues to feed itself. Because you're creating an environment for it to grow. Because once you understand the biological uh, of the aquaculture and in a controlled environment, you're actually able to get your fish delivery on time. Okay. Instead of waiting for the sun the, the, oh, yeah, yeah. and the, the, the harvest, you're no longer susceptible to the nature, natural environment. Right. So it actually puts Singapore in a totally different uh, position because of technology. And such technology uh, is uh, happening all over the world. I could even imagine that one day we can have fresh milk because we could have uh, cow farming on, on the sea. On it's the happening in the in, in Netherlands. They actually have 
a, a kind of football field like the floating platform. Ah. You have cows up there, and the cows are just confined on that space. And then below, you have your cheese production, your milk uh, production, and you actually can get fresh produce going forward. So it's it's only I, I I frankly think that going forward, it all these things are just limited by our imagination, and with all these things that's happening, with the talents that we have and the youth uh, that we are getting on stream in thinking really out of the box, the sky's the limit. Okay. And things that you could never imagine, like uh, aqua farming in Singapore could easily, maybe not just uh, in eventually 30% by 2030, maybe even stretching beyond. Because it, it, it is no longer limited to that kind of um, farmland. Yeah. You can make it vertical. If we can house people in buildings, why can't we start building buildings that could produce fish in vertical fa format? That's amazing. This all sounds like science fiction. <laughs> 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 but it's it's, a, it's all a fact, right? Yes, it's all a fact. Absolutely. Okay, we are we are sh I think about five minutes away from the end, but uh, so I I'd, I'd like to get past Ten. just two issues, mm. um, two important issues. One is okay, the revenue side of the budget. Um, I mean, we go, we have uh, a lot of social spending yeah. coming, right? Health. Uh, safety nets yeah. and so on uh, and so what revenue options are available for singapore i mean of course there's the gst mm -hmm. uh, which uh, which which i want you to comment on uh, <laughs> of course and including on when you think it will mm -hmm. kick in mm -hmm. but other than the gst are there other will the gst first of all be enough to take care of all our social spending needs and other than GST, what other rev revenue options do we have? So maybe, Bar Barnabas, sure. you could address that. Sure. Let's talk about GST first. Um, I think GST is, uh, again, an another elegant solution to uh, get recurrent revenue. You know, I think the easy question is why don't just raise taxes, mm. you know, like business taxes, corporate taxes, income right. taxes, why GST? Simply because raising taxes is not competitive for the economy, you know, and hence the GST, uh, it's a progressive tax regime. And that's important because as we've seen in, in, the, in the latest results, the Gini coefficient has actually showed that the income, the income inequality in Singapore has actually uh, been better, you know, compared to where it first started in pre-COVID-19 levels. You know, so that is uh, somewhat elegant. But that's because of transfers, yeah. right? It's also transfers also, yeah. but I think by the, the essence of GST itself, it's a progressive tax system, you know. Yeah. So, um, in so in the sense that uh, when, I mean, in the sense that because uh, the the the, I mean, let me correct myself. No, I mean with the, I mean GST in the sense because the while well, the poor actually pays for the 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 more so the the essential you know goods and services. Uh, we see that uh, for in in the budget per se, there is uh, the, 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 most of the very rich, you know, uh, only receives uh, a part of the benefits but pays most of uh, the cost yeah. uh, as we've seen in budget 2021, you know. So, but by itself, GST, it's uh, very much to actually help the country uh, um, from the revenue perspective, you know, uh, to, in order to stay competitive while raising revenue, you know. So when, so when it, when do we think that it might come in? I think I will just repeat what uh, Finance Minister Heng has mentioned, it's more so sooner rather than later. Sim simply because we have actually no, no, seen... No. Maybe a little uh, more precise, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what? 2022, 2023? There is, a, there is a range. There is a range, 2022 to 2025. Okay. So let's, pick, let's take a pick. I don't know. You know but it, 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 it will rather be sooner rather than later. You know, on that, uh, and to really answer your question as to when, mm. we have to ask ourselves when would the end of COVID happen? Because Fair that's point. when the the economy starts to pick up. That's when you know uh, the country is more so uh, ready, you know, to have a uh, higher GST. Yeah. You know, but other revenue sources, I would dare say, really, is that 
our revenue income, at least from a country, from an economy perspective, you know, um, is uh, very much dependent on how we grow. You know, the CIT, the corporate income tax, the yes. PIT, which is the personal income tax, is very much highly correlated mm -hmm. to how growth is, is actually uh, more so it, uh, from a GDP perspective, right. you know. So I think the best bet for us to actually stay, uh, to have our recurrent income keeping up with the, with the recurrent spending will really be allowing Singapore to grow mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah. The growth is the best revenue generator. Indeed, mm. yeah, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Okay, um, okay, very good. F uh, just a final thought F from each of you. What are the big uncertainties that Singapore will face this year? Briefly. Also, one obvious one, as I alluded to, is how uh, how uh, the pandemic will pan out. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I get the real challenging thing over there is not just that Singapore will be able to bring infection rate very low, which it has, mm. just because we are so uh, dependent on the external economy. Uh, in order for you to begin to bring in foreign visitors, uh, which will revive the tourism sector, for example, we identify as a major affected sector, uh, the other country has a correspondingly mm. be able to bring the infection infection rate down. Correct. We can open up, but if others don't, it's exactly. no, no good for us. And so, and, and, and so of <coughs> course, with the vaccine available now, it, 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 you know, as is commonly said, you just see a little light at the end of the tunnel, but you're hardly there mm. because mm. there can be new variants and the vaccines could well still be ineffective. So you need a longer time to, to get herd immunity. From, from vaccination. So back to the earlier point, this is one unusual type of pandemic that's global. So hits us really heavy as, uh, as uh, an economy dependent on international uh, uh, integration. Uh, and new things can crop up. So I, I, to my mind, that would be like uh, one of the biggest uncertainties. Okay. Yeah. Barnabas, your take? <laughs> Well, uh, Prof will talk about COVID and, 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 and how it might evolve. <coughs> I will bring in a new uh, game changer, which okay. is geopolitical tensions. Uh -huh. you know, yeah, we actually seen uh, how the world actually saw impeded growth yes. uh, during the US-China trade tensions. Right. Now we are looking at uh, something's happening in the Taiwan Strait. Yes. Uh, in, back in 2020, we have seen arm clashes against China and India. You know, uh, Singapore is a small player, mm. you know, and uh, we are at the whims and fancies mm. of big global players out there. That's a fair We have point. to be careful. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes, Matt. Well, I want to, of course, on the, I think I agree with Prof, but I want to give a different take on the pandemic. Is I think the, the key thing for us is how quickly we can adapt um, to a COVID environment. That means to be able to live and thrive in a COVID environment. Mm. We have a narrow window of rebound. Every country at some point in time will rebound. The country that uh, is able to conduct business in an effective and safe manner will be the one that will capture the most opportunities. And the window is a small one. It's dependent on how fast we get our vaccination ops are done effectively and quickly, but also quite importantly, how we can shape our infrastructure to facilitate business and logistics flows. For example, we saw some investment into um, Changi Airport and the ports, how can you handle passengers, how can you handle goods in a safe manner, assuming that COVID doesn't go away. So the one who can get there first will be the one that can facilitate business. So it is by no coincidence that uh, WEF is placing a bet that we can do this part mm. uh, probably better than anywhere else in the world. Mm. So um, I, I would say that that is an important thing for us to do. We get it right. I think we will be able to leverage quite a fair bit on this economic rebound. Thanks. Douglas, mm -hmm. what, is what is the biggest uncertainty that you, that you can think of that will face us this year? It's just right in front of our face. Uh, what Prof and the Mayor has mentioned, the, the pandemic. Um, it, it's the biggest uncertainty because nobody knows what's down the road. And the last one that you can learn your lesson from is 1918. I don't think many people could tell you what, what went on during that time. Um, and it's a different scenario during that time as well, um, because the world was quite, quite in a different 
uh, in terms of technology advancement. Right, right. But having gone through the last year, we have seen how our local enterprises have actually quickly uh, built resilience, especially the supply chain resilience. Mm. Manufacturing actually has done, has done much better compared to the previous year. It actually contributed 21% to the GDP last year. And going forward, we, f we, we completely feel that we have got an opportunity, like what Mayor has mentioned, to then how do we work in collaboration with es especially our ASEAN counterparts. Although there's a, a huge challenge, I think this challenge is facing all of us at the same time. And I think the ASEAN uh, becoming a fourth largest economy by 2030 is not off the table yet mm. because everybody has come down. Yeah. So the, 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 the packing order is there. <laughs> so fifth e largest economy moving to fourth, we will still get there, <coughs> meaning that the pie is growing bigger. How do we then um, be smart enough to work even in a much more ASEAN-centric approach, especially uh, in the manufacturing front? Because the other ASEAN countries will have their different strengths and challenges in terms of their manufacturing supply chain, which actually we do not need to want to go there, what Prof has mentioned earlier on, because we've actually moved along together. And in this budget, there's uh, intellectual property on that, mm -hmm. yes. that front as well, which is something that we should continue to deepen mm -hmm. and broaden and actually get most people to actually put it here as a safe environment. Actually, also back to your question about the aquaculture, why can't we be actually um, nurturing and harvesting to even the region as well? Because of the safe environment and the, the, the brand that the Singapore itself has built over the many years. Mm. Yeah. Right point. Okay, absolutely last question, but this is like <laughs> almost a yes or no question. Right. Um, 10 seconds per answer. Will one budget be sufficient this year? <laughs> Do you think there will be more than one budget? Prof. In all likelihood, more than one. More than one. Mm. Manubus? <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Sorry, no yes or no. I think it depends. Yeah. Depends on how COVID evolves. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one will set us on a good footing, but we'll watch it, and if it need be, we have to push for it. We are blessed. I hope we continue to be blessed. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, DPM, at the beginning of his speech... His New Year resolution is his to New have Year one resolution budget. Was, <laughs> I want to have only one budget this yeah. year, not five. Yes. So that's why I asked. So I hope, I hope we get one. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, with that, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for thank a wonderful roundtable. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much.